adopted. This work is part of a project carried out between Physics Institute of Cantabria, Aragon Institute of Technology and CNM, which received funds from the 2021 call for proof of concept projects to trans transfer technology to, to sorry, one moment, ah, key. to transfer to, to industry the, devel the developments carried out in the research centers. This camera will measure the moon, the moon trajectory and its time of flight, combining the LGAT detection technology and deep learning imaging algorithms to boost either the imaging spatial resolution with a very significant reduction of the exposure time. The aim of this project is to validate in an industrial environment a technological concept validated in the laboratory, growing from a TRL2 to a TRL4 or 5. But what is, a, is it a muon tomography camera? To answer this question, today we have invited Dr. Pablo Martinez, who is one of the leading national specialists in the, in the field. Dr. Martinez received his PhD from the University of Cantabria in, 2020, in 2010. And his main work topic was the alignment of the muon system of the compact muon solenoid detector of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. After his, his PhD, he was hired as senior scientist for the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology at Zurich, focusing his research of the search for supersymmetric particles in the SAR CMS experiment. From 2010 and to 2017, he led several analyses and held various coordination positions within the CMS collaboration as head of trigger simulation and interpretation for supersymmetric searches, as a head of third generation supersymmetric particle research group. In 2017, he was here as a, as a Ramonica Hall researcher at Physics Institute of Cantabria, Cantabria, where he continues his activity in supersymmetric particle and dark matter, matter searchers. Since 2018, he participates in the design and construction of the CMS MIP timing detector, a detector with the capacity to measure the particle passage time with high precision, and that will be installed at the CERN. Since 2019, Dr. Martinez is in charge of the data performance group of this detector, which include, which include its full software change, geometry, reconstruction, and performance. Also, in 2015, he co-founded a company dedicated to the application of moon tomography to industry. Since then, he has developed an intense activity in this line. Dr. Martinez, thank you very much for being with us, and the floor is yours. I stop to share mine, and please share your... Okay. Your I'll stop mine. Uh, okay. Okay. I think you can see the slides. Yes. Okay. Very good. So, uh, well, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for for the introduction, Salva, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to come here to talk about um, the project in which uh, we, as, as Salva was saying, we have recently started to work. Um, and what I'm going to do in this presentation is to, uh, to show you a little bit the context of this project. So uh, the, the first thing that I'm going to do is to show you what is uh, this uh, muon tomography technique. Uh, muon tomography, sometimes it is called muography. It depends a little bit on the taste. And, and part, of my, part of my talk is going to be dedicated to that. I will show you some applications that are being done nowadays in, in different places of the world. And, and then I will focus uh, on, the, on the kind of application that we uh, would like to target in this project, which is the use of uh, muon tomography for uh, essentially for, for industrial applications. And, and then at the end of the talk, I'm going to, to talk about the, the project, the idea that we, that we have and, and how we are trying to, to implement it. So uh, I just go to, to my first slide. Um, 
Well, uh, what is myon tomography? Uh, when talking about myon tomography, the first thing that we need to, to explain is uh, what, what, is the, what is this technique? So this technique essentially um, is the use of uh, what, what it's called cosmic myons, which is um, it's a flow of myons that myons are a kind of uh, particles that are reaching the surface of the earth. The production of these myons is coming from the upper layers of the atmosphere, essentially because the Earth is being constantly uh, uh, bombarded by, by um, protons, essentially. These, these are the so-called cosmic rays. When they collide with the, with the atoms of the atmosphere, they produce these flux of myons that are able to reach the, the surface of the Earth. And the point is that these myons are quite energetic. They have an energy of the order of uh, two to three GeV. That's the, well, that's the, the most uh, uh, typical value, but you can see here the spectrum, which is, uh, it's relatively broad. And this is going to be relevant for, for the application that we will show you later. And, and the angular distribution that these myons are following, uh, essentially um, uh, the, the angle with the, with the vertical uh, is as you can see here. So. The point is that in, at, the, at the surface of the Earth, uh, we are expecting to have a flux of about 10,000 myons per square meter and per minute uh, uh, following this uh, distributions in energy and, and, and this distribution in the angular momentum. So the, the point is that uh, when these myons are interacting with the objects that they find when, when um, traveling uh, in the space, they are going to interact in two ways, mainly in two ways. There are more, but uh, most uh, importantly, in two ways, which is losing energy and then also deviating the trajectory in what, what is called an effect uh, called multiple scattering. So the, the denser the matter is, the, the more the energy loss is going to, to be present. And also the, the biggest is going to be the angular deviation. So the muon tomography is just um, an application in which we are going to, to measure these properties of the muons uh, in order to do density maps of the objects that the muons are, are essentially uh, uh, passing through. And you can do this in two different ways. You can do this uh, using what is called uh, absorption muon tomography, in which essentially you are only uh, considering one muon detector, as you can see here in this picture on the left. You, you just have one muon detector. And then what you are trying to do is to measure the flux as a function of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the angle, let's say. In such a way that if you have a, a very heavy object, something usually for this kind of application, typically something big, like for example, a volcano. If you have inside the volcano, for example, a cavity, a large cavity, when you, are, um, when you are pointing your detector uh, to that cavity, you are going to expect, what you might expect is an increase of the flux because the muons are going to be uh, not so much attenuated as in the other parts of the volcano where you don't have this cavity. So that's the, that's the idea. Then there is a second uh, kind of uh, muon tomography, which is called the scattering. And in this uh, second version, uh, what you are exploiting is the multiple scattering. So you need two detectors, not just one. You need to put one detector before the object you want to, to inspect, and then another one after the object you, you want to inspect. And the idea is that you are going to measure the deviation of the trajectory. This is typically used for, for objects not so large, medium size, let's say medium to, to small sizes. Uh, and for example, typical applications here is the um, border security or nuclear applications that I, I will be showing you uh, later on. So just to give you an idea uh, about the novelty of this technique, uh, in 2017, uh, very, very few people were actually working on, 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 this, um, on this thing where, because it's relatively, the idea is not really very new in the sense that uh, some some possible applications were uh, studied in the past, but uh, until essentially until uh, a few years ago or so, it was not really uh, it, it was not really applied, um, uh, let's say, professionally. So in 2017, uh, these people were working in in muon tomography. 
Uh, there are some of them that are uh, companies, like for example, in, in Canada, this uh, Triumph uh, company, or for example, here in Spain, uh, Mion Systems. But uh, there are also uh, public uh, research institutions, like for, for example, INFN, Los Alamos in, in the United States, in, in Japan, the University of Tokyo and others. And uh, this is the, the picture in four years later. Uh, you can see that uh, more and more groups uh, are joining this, uh, this effort, let's say. And, and I, I must say that not all of them are here in this, uh, in this uh, plot because it's actually complicated to put all of them because uh, the, the technique is, is uh, let's say that is, uh, nowadays it's quite sexy and many, many, many groups are, are joining and, and trying to, to work on, on this uh, technology. Okay, so let me just show you, uh, before going to the details of how this technique works, let me show you just some, a few examples. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you the um, volcanology applications, and, and in particular, I'm going to show you the, the monitoring of the Vesuvius Volcano. This is one application that the INFN is, uh, is doing in, in Italy. So uh, here, obviously, the kind of um, tomography they are applying is the absorption in such a way that they are putting here a detector. You have a sketch of the, de of the detector here. And, and the point is that they are monitoring the Vesuvius, uh, measuring the, the flux of, of meals that they get. And here at the bottom, uh, the bottom right, what you have is um, a, another application, in this case in Japan, uh, in which they are monitoring two different uh, volcanoes there in Japan. And actually, this in, in Japan, they are... Uh, doing something really fancy because they are combining the information coming from the MION tomography uh, with other sources of information that they have about the other measurements that they have. And, and they claim that they are even able to, to perform dynamic studies on the magma convection. So they say that they can really see the, the slow motion of the, of the magma inside the, the volcano. In any case, these kind of applications, you can imagine that the Exposure time, the time that you need in order to get a meaningful, a meaningful, meaningful sample of data is of the order of one year or so. So you have to, the, the point here is that you need to have very stable detectors that are going to, to, to be operating continuously. And, and well, and these are the kind of results that you, that you can expect, these kind of density maps of the, of the inner parts of the volcano. Another application, very interesting, is uh, in, in mining. Uh, for example, in Canada, there is this private company, uh, Geotomography Technologies, CRM uh, Geotomography Technologies. And the application they are giving to the technique is related to, to, the, um, to the finding of new spots of material. In, in particular, they are going to uranium or lead um, uh, mines. They, they have two applications, one in Canada and one in the United States. And essentially what you have here on the right is the different galleries, all these gray, uh, uh, let's say columns, uh, all, all those are just uh, galleries that have been already uh, dig on the, on the ground uh, for, for this mine. And the point is, where to continue digging to try to find a new spot of material. So what they are doing is to put MEON detectors on different, uh, on different locations of the mine. Uh, they are working in, in absorption mode as well. So they leave the detectors there for a few months, uh, but then they combine the information of all the detectors and, and they perform some kind of a triangularization of the, of the flags in order to see where the, the, the big density, where the, for example, the uranium is, is located. So this is something that is being uh, worked out right now. Then there are other applications uh, related to mining. It's, it's not a strictly speaking mining, but uh, there is this uh, application from this company in Israel in which they are trying to find um, underground structures using, using MEON detectors. So here, the novelty is that they, they are building these kind of cylindrical detectors and, and they try to, to put these detectors underground. Uh, with this geometry, it's relatively simple to, to drill the, the ground and, and insert the detector. And then also by applying triangularization of the, of the flags, they are expecting to see uh, cavities or maybe uh, dense structures uh, in underground. That, that's essentially the point. 
There are also applications in archaeology or, or even in, in maintenance of the uh, heritage. Uh, the first application here is, is uh, in Naples, and, and it's uh, essentially the finding of the hidden galleries in the Mount Echia. Mount Echia is, is um, a mount in, in Naples, and inside the mount, uh, there used to be what is called the, the Bourbon Tunnel. And apparently it was a plan for the, for the kings at that moment to escape in, in case there was some kind of riot or something like this. So they have excavated this mount and there were a few galleries that they can take to, to essentially get away in case of problems. And for many years, these uh, galleries were abandoned. And nowadays, uh, well, it was not clear if all the galleries were rediscovered because in some of them, uh, they were suspecting that uh, uh, they were blocked and, and they were not easily, easily accessible anymore. So the point is that they use essentially the same technique as for the mining of uranium. They put different detectors in different, in different places of the galleries. And what they found is a new gallery that was, uh, it was not known, essentially by, by, by seeing an increase of the flux of mions in, in, a, given, in a given direction. Also in, in Italy as well, in Florence, uh, they are using this technique, in this case, not the absorption, but in this case, a scattering to monitor the inner state of the, um, of the dome of Santa Maria del Fiore. So the point here is that they are putting two different detectors one before the, the, the wall of the dome and another one after. And, and they are monitoring the, the level of wear that the, the, the structure is, is suffering because of the humidity, the rain, the wind, etc., etc. So there are also applications in, in border security. Uh, uh, Italy is, is working on, on this. Also, there is a company in, in the United States, Decision Science, that uh, are trying to commercialize a, a system. And here the point is to install some kind of a portal uh, in which you have one detector on the upper side of, um, uh, of your portal and another one below. And you can, uh, with, this, um, with this setup, you can put essentially containers or trucks or whatever you want to see. You can get them through, let's say, and uh, you can make an inspection of, um, of, the, um, of the kind of material that they are uh, carrying, right? And this application is, for example, very good uh, in order to detect very heavy materials, like, for example, radioactive materials, uranium and, and others, because for those kind of materials, the deviation that the muons are suffering is so large that even with two minutes, three minutes of, um, of uh, data taking, you can really uh, detect if you have uh, this kind of material in the in the in the track, and and this of course is is very interesting for for the border security and 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 applications like that similar to that. Also, this is being applied to the to the industry. Uh, sorry, to the nuclear industry. I mean, uh, in two different ways. Uh, it's being used to characterize the nuclear waste. This is being done in, uh, in the UK by, by this company, Linkeos Technology. So the, the idea is that uh, these barrels where they put the, um, the nuclear waste, usually the, mid, the, the one with uh, not a large activation, the, the, medium, the medium ones. Um, so they put this in a barrel, they put concrete on the barrel and, and they store it for a few years. And the point is that the, the, the radioactive material can have leaks and it can deteriorate the concrete in such a way that instead of being uh, confined, as you can see here on the right, for example, uh, you can see that in some cases it is really uh, making corrosion on, on the concrete. And this is dangerous because eventually it can, uh, it can uh, break the barrel and that's something you want to avoid. So the point is that you want to have a system to try to see this um, uh, these problems uh, to anticipate them uh, without having to open the, the barrel and this is being used um, with me on with me on tomography also uh, it's being used not only for the nuclear waste but also to to make the monitoring of the fuel casks where where the the, the fuel casks um, those are structures that are being used to to put the the high intensity radioactive material 
uh, usually the, the consume fu uh, fuel, that's what you put there. And it's really, so these are very large structures. And, and the point is that the integrity of the structure is also very important because uh, the, the activity of this kind of uh, samples is really huge. So what they do is to try to monitor this also with, uh, with me on tomography. Okay, so let me adjust a little bit. The, okay. So um, the kind of application that uh, we are trying to, to pursue here is uh, a little bit different. So we want to apply muon tomography to the, to the industry. And, and the idea is to use the technique as a non-destructive testing technique. Uh, uh, and this is something that is used in the industry. There are different technologies, like for example, ultrasounds, uh, there is uh, gammographies, there are many, many uh, NDTs that are being applied uh, nowadays in the industry. So we think that muon tomography can be one more, and, and in particular, we think uh, it can be very beneficial in some, in some cases. So the idea is to make, um, using the muon tomography, preventive maintenance of uh, the equipment, for example, to see uh, degradations in the industrial equipment and, and so on. To perform also quality control of the production process. In, in some cases, you can use muon tomography to, to see how the, the production process is, is working. For example, uh, estimating uh, liquid interfaces or liquid levels, stuff like that. And also a risk assessment and an evaluation of, uh, of, of, the, of the structural integrity of the, of the plant or the factory or or, or whatever. Then the, the good properties of myography, of muon tomography, um, are essentially two. The first one is the, the large power of penetration. So uh, myons are able to penetrate, uh, just to give you an idea, so you can detect myons uh, even 700 meters underground. That's why it's being used, for example, for the mining, because myons, they really penetrate everything. Uh, so if you have a factory, you have, for example, a blast furnace, uh, like a big one with uh, several meters of uh, steel, for example, that's no problem for the meals. They can go through and they can give you the information of the deviation. The other interesting aspect is that uh, you don't need uh, to touch the object physically because uh, when the, let's say that the detectors, uh, they don't need to, to really touch physically the, the object. And this is very interesting because it uh, allows to, um, to apply this technique while the equipment is in production. This is extremely important. For example, if you want to, to make an inspection of a pipe, as we will be, as we will be uh, showing later, uh, in, for the muon tomography, you don't need to stop the flow of the material through the pipe. The, the factory can continue working because you are not going to touch the pipe by any means. And the meals are going to be passing through anyways. It doesn't matter if you measure, measure them or not. So uh, essentially, in, in this sense, it's, it's a, a very nice property because uh, this, is, um, this is saving a lot of time, of course, uh, to, the, to the companies. So just to give you uh, an idea, uh, an example more than an idea, this is the, precisely the, the, the pipes, the application to the pipes. So the point here is to try to estimate a degradation of the walls of the pipes um, using muon tomography. So here you have a few pictures of uh, different pipes. Uh, here you don't see the detectors, but the detectors, uh, they are supposed to be uh, above and below this, um, this pipe. And this is particularly interesting, for example, for one case, uh, which is the case of the insulated pipes. So here at the bottom left, what you see is an insulated pipe. So this is a pipe that has a cover, uh, which, is, um, which is very, very light. It's a material that is very light. And the purpose of this uh, cover is to isolate thermically the, the pipe. So you want to avoid a, a loss of heat in the pipe. That's the point. And why this is uh, so problematic? Well, this is problematic because, for example, uh, you cannot apply here ultrasounds. Ultrasounds is something that is being used commonly uh, in order to, to do the, um, the maintenance of, uh, of the pipes. However, you cannot do that in, in this kind of isolated pipes because this light material is absorbing any acoustic effect that you might have. So for example, 
this is a very nice application for the muons because since this material is very light and and light materials almost do not deviate the the muons it's uh, for the muons is almost transparent uh, what you see is this transparency i mean the, what you see is that you only see the the pipe and and the and the steel of the pipe but you don't see the isolation layer so well this is essentially what you can see here in this uh, in these plots you have here the front view of a pipe the top view and you can see here for example in the in the middle in the middle uh, bottom uh, plot and also on the right you can see uh, a pipe that has some degradation in the middle part more or less so you can see how the um, uh, somehow the the um, the, uh, the picture is fainter in that region uh, showing that there is a loss of uh, a loss of um, thickness of the pipe all right so coming to to the detection hardware used for this kind of applications. I, I'm going to be very brief because actually there are many different detectors and, and also it depends a lot on the on the particular application that you want to have. But uh, I wanted to stress um, uh, essentially three three aspects of the of the hardware that you are going to use for me on tomography. So the first one is the is the price, right? Uh, I think this is, uh, for example, when we are working with um, R&D applications, of course, price is always is always an important aspect and is always something central that you have to take into account. However, usually the budgets for for R&D are much higher, and and you can afford if you can justify that you need uh, some given specifications. Usually, you manage to to get the money, and 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 that usually works. For the for the industrial applications, this is not exactly the this is not exactly the case. Why? Because you have competing technologies, for example, ultrasounds, uh, gammography, and others, and and also because you have a limit. For example, if your detectors are more expensive than the time that it takes to, for example, for the pipes to stop the production, uh, open the pipe, have a look, check that everything is all right, and close it. Uh, if you are not cheaper than that, uh, of course, you, you, uh, it, it's nonsense to, to, to try to, to do this um, uh, technique, right? So the price is really an issue for the, for the detectors. Then, of course, the granularity of the detectors, because the granularity uh, is going to give you the spatial resolution. So granularity is um, what is the, the precision that you are going to have when uh, measuring the, the deviation of the muons, right? So this is, of course, this is a key aspect of the, of the detection. The better the granularity, the better the precision, and then the images that you are going to get are also better and, 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 and with, a, a, with a better resolution, obviously. Then uh, something also very important that it's not always the case in R&D applications is the packaging. Because these detectors, uh, most of them will have to operate in, in non-laboratory conditions, but it's not only non-laboratory conditions. I would say that the, the conditions at the factories are particularly challenging. We are talking about, for example, if you want to apply this to a blast furnace, we are talking about the environments with a lot of dust, with an atmosphere quite polluted by different, uh, by different uh, gases and and, and dust and, and other stuff. Usually you have um, the environment can be uh, hot because uh, usually in the industry you have a lot of uh, chemical um, processes that usually involve uh, uh, heat. So that's, uh, that's a problem. In some cases you can, you can even have uh, magnetic fields. For example, uh, if you are using um, arc um, furnaces, uh, electric furnaces with uh, voltaic arcs and stuff like that. Uh, you also have magnetic fields that are coming from the, from the um, system that is heating the, the material. So all this has to be taken into account, right? And, and that's, uh, that's uh, really important and sometimes is, is very challenging. Uh, I would say that there are three main technologies being used nowadays by the different uh, by the different groups. One is the scintilla uh, scintillator fibers. So this is um, essentially small fibers of uh, scintillator that gives you a great granularity because they are usually very 
very thin uh, and, and can be used usually uh, like this in, in clusters to, to perform like a, like a grid in which you can detect, uh, you can have the, the position of the, of the mium passing by, by this structure. You can also have a resistive plate chambers. This is being used as well. You have here a picture in which you see the strips. So the idea is that this detector, this detector for example, would be measuring uh, this coordinate, the, the horizontal coordinate, because essentially what you are telling is which is the strip that got, um, that got activated by the mion. And then uh, people are also using multi-wire chambers. So here the idea is that instead of a strips like, like here, what you have is wires and, and you put all these wires into, into a gas chamber and the, the mions are going to ionize the gas and the signal is going to be collected by the, by the wires. This is, uh, in, in short, this is the, the, the mechanism. Concerning the, the software, the, the algorithms, um, Mion tomography belongs to a class of problem known as uh, the inverse problem in, in mathematics. And this is, is a very common problem. The, the point is that instead of knowing, um, instead of knowing the, the input of something and the laws that are transforming that input into that output, and trying to predict the output, that would be the, the direct problem, let's say, in, in mathematics. The inverse problem is the other way around. What you have is the input, uh, you have the output, you know how the, how the input transforms uh, in the output from the point of view of the physics, you know the, the laws, but uh, those laws are depending on the material which is inside, and, and this is unknown. So what you are trying to get is that information, the, the the, the information about uh, the material. And these problems are usually very hard to solve. Uh, they have a lot of uh, common issues. For example, it's very frequent that in these problems, there is not a, a single solution. Uh, what you usually get is family of solutions, families of solutions that can be, that can be combined. Uh, for that reason, it's very, it's very common that uh, the companies are not only applying uh, one technique, but they are combining different techniques. For example, they can try to use ultrasounds and combine that information with mion tomography. That, that's, for example, very interesting. And in any case, in general, the, there are three, three groups of algorithms. Uh, one, which is, um, uh, it's a family uh, in which uh, they are exploiting uh, what I call here purely geometrical methods. So essentially here, some assumption about uh, how the mion is um, deviating is done. For example, in this algorithm, which is one of the most uh, famous, by the way, the point of closest approach, the, the POCA algorithm. The idea here is that you assume that the mion is suffering the scattering only in one single point, right? So all the, all the deviation is produced by a heat in one single point, by, by, by an interaction in a single point. So what you are doing is to just um, find the middle point, well, the point of closest approach in between the uh, incoming trajectory and the outcoming trajectory, and you assign that point as a, as a place of a density because you are assuming that the, the interaction took place there. There are also more complex algorithms based, for example, in, in maximum likelihood estimates. Typically here, the, the geometry that you are looking at is uh, voxelized. That's the terminology they use. So it means that you uh, somehow discretize the, the space, as you can see here. You, you make a small uh, um, voxels. And then you try to assign, using a likelihood, you're trying to assign the right material to each of these, uh, to each of these uh, boxes, let's say. That's the, that's the point. And then there is also a quite intense activity. Uh, this is quite new. Uh, in order to use uh, machine learning based uh, algorithms to, to do this. For example, uh, we have been working with uh, convolutional neural networks in which uh, we are combining actually the purely geometrical methods. So we produce some images uh, using this uh, POCA approach, but then we classify these images using um, uh, a convolutional neural network that it's able to perform a regression, for example, to the, to the thickness of the pipe in, in this application that I'm showing you here on the, on the left. Okay, so I think um, uh, 
that's uh, enough for the for the introduction. Uh, now I'm going to start focusing on on the project uh, that we are trying to to do. And in order to do that, I'm going to mention uh, one big problem that uh, Mion tomography has uh, nowadays, and that it has not been. Um, I mean, it was not solved yet by by nobody, uh, to my knowledge. So the point is that um, Mion tomography uh, uh, essentially operates always uh, making an assumption, which is that the momentum of the mions uh, is essentially the most uh, probable value. So in all the algorithms, the momentum of the mion is, is being fixed to about two, three GBs, uh, and, and that's it. And, and this is a problem because, for example, in a scattering mion tomography, the, the deviation uh, really depends on the momentum. Actually, it depends uh, almost, uh, almost the same as the, as the part related to the material properties that are condensed here in this radiation length, uh, here this uh, X the zero that I'm um, showing you here. So this is introducing an entanglement between the properties of the material and the momentum of the mion. Why mion tomography is working even with this? Well, it's working because the, the spectrum of the mions is relatively sharp. So most of the mions are really coming uh, around two, three GeV. So to some extent, you can still use this uh, most probable value and you can still get meaningful images and meaningful information. But of course, uh, this is uh, this is a problem, and this is degrading the resolution, the intrinsic resolution of the of the method of the method. So the question is, okay, why don't you measure the momentum of the mions? Well, and the, the problem is that this is typically done in, for example, in R and D applications. This is typically done using magnetic fields, uh, but this is just too expensive for a commercial applications. Well, actually, it has two problems. It's very expensive. Uh, it also requires very large structures because uh, if you want to see the deviation or the curvature of a mion of about uh, 3 GeV, you need huge magnetic fields uh, and you need also a large space to, to, to let this uh, helix, to let this uh, curvature to develop in order to get a meaningful, a meaningful measurement. So, this is really not an option for, for mion tomography. You cannot do this uh, in a volcano or, or, or in, in an industry or stuff like that. It is it's just impossible. And, and I'm going to show you one example here about uh, how good having this momentum would be. So here, what I'm, what I'm showing you is a simulation uh, of, uh, of the crucible of an electric arc furnace that you, you have here. This is the Jan 4 model. Uh, and in, in particular, what I'm focusing at is the gray part just uh, inside, that cylinder, which is very dense. And, and that's the part that you want to, to monitor. So uh, here, we, what we have done is to apply the, the, the most uh, simple algorithm, the, the POCA, the, which is purely geometrical. But then uh, if you don't have, if you take data for one, for one hour, for example, and you don't have any momentum measurement, this is the kind of thing that you can expect, the, the one on the right. So here I'm showing you the, the C coordinate and the white coordinate on the horizontal axis. Uh, so essentially what you see is this uh, blur here, uh, essentially nothing. However, uh, look what happens when you introduce a 10% momentum resolution. So a, a measurement of the momentum with, uh, with a 10% resolution. Then uh, suddenly you uh, start to see the, 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 the denser part of this structure, which is the cylinder. You uh, start to see that structure uh, uh, very nicely. And, and of course, if you continue taking data, you might, you might get um, even better resolution of this image. But as you can see, this is really a game changer. Having the momentum in the in this kind of applications, it's really a game changer of the of the thing. Okay, so what is the idea? What is the idea that we are trying to exploit in in the in the project? Well, is the measurement of the time of flight of the of the mions 
in order to estimate the momentum. So the, the point is that if we would be able to measure the, the time at which the, well, imagine just uh, this uh, sketch of uh, an scattering muon tomography setup in which you have the, the let's say, the, the first detector, then the second detector. So imagine that we introduce here uh, a timing layer, for example, that is able to give us the time of passage of the muons uh, through, through the detector, right? And imagine that we can do the same in the second detector in such a way that we can estimate the time that the muon took to go from the first detector to the second detector. Okay, that if we can do that, that would be great because we can measure the, this delta t, so this difference in time. We can estimate the, the length of the trajectory. That's no problem because we are measuring the, we are measuring the, the position of the, of the muons as well. And having the time and having the length, uh, we can estimate the velocity of the particle. And uh, with the velocity, we can obviously estimate the, the momentum. For example, if we would have here uh, a timing detector with a resolution of the order of 50 picoseconds, and we say that the, the two detectors are um, separated by of the order of uh, one meter, let's say, uh, this would be giving you a momentum resolution of 10%. So something like that would be uh, putting you in this situation, the left versus the right, which is, which is really, really great. So, um, well, and obviously uh, when, we, when we had this idea, the, we thought that there was a perfect match because for example, the, the low gain avalanche diodes, the LGATs, uh, are a perfect match uh, for, this, uh, for this task. And in particular, um, IFCA, CNM, and, and, and also Itainova, uh, we have been working already for quite some time on the, on the um, timing detector of CMS. Uh, the timing detector of CMS uh, is part of the phase two upgrade project of CMS. So this is uh, a new detector that is going to be installed in CMS at CERN uh, for, the, for the next uh, accelerator, the high luminosity LHC. And, and this detector is essentially, it has two parts. It has uh, the barrel, uh, which is using uh, another technology. It's not using LGATs, it's using um, uh, crystals. But then there are the two end caps at the two sides that are being instrumented with LGATs. And the point of this detector is to measure the, the, the charged particles with a resolution of the order of 30 to 40 uh, picoseconds, right? So. Uh, since we have all the expertise uh, working, working on this, we thought it was a natural thing to try to exploit this and try to, uh, to have or to build a demonstrator in which we were using uh, the LGATs in order to measure the time of the muons in the context of a myography application. And this is essentially the, the 4D Tomulgat project that Salva was introducing in uh, in his intervention. So essentially the, the point is to build a demonstrator that has this time of flight uh, measurement capability using LGATS. So uh, it's a collaboration between three institutes, as I was mentioning before, uh, CNM, which is focusing uh, obviously uh, on, the, on the LGATS uh, part, uh, IFCA, uh, which is focusing on the integration of the whole thing and, and also the um, the software aspects, the, uh, the algorithms and so on. And then uh, ITA Innova, which is focusing on the distributed clock and the power distribution of the, of the system. So the idea is to have some kind of a telescope, as you can see here. The dimensions are not yet um, established. We are, we are right now uh, doing the, the, the design. So, so this is something that uh, will be ready soon, but not yet. But just to give you an idea that uh, these uh, boxes will be of the order of um, uh, several centimeters, uh, 12 centimeters, more or less, 12 times 12, something like this, probably not very different to that. And, and the idea is to have one upper detector, a lower detector, uh, measuring the position, but also the, the time. So you can estimate the momentum and try to, to reproduce and uh, try to, to, to see how much you, you are improving with, with that. We also have uh, stakeholders. 
Uh, we have three companies very interested in this development. One, which is obvious, is Mion Systems. This is the company that is uh, dedicated to the application of Mion tomography. And, and this kind of development, by far, is it's, it's out of their, of their capabilities nowadays. Uh, and then there are two big companies, uh, Sidenor and Ferroglob, that they are already using uh, Mion tomography for some of their uh, processes. Uh, they are quite happy with uh, with the results, and and they wanted to well, they wanted to to see uh, whether this uh, momentum measurement in Mion tomography was giving uh, giving even better better performance than than what they are getting without the momentum. So. Uh, those are the stakeholders that, that we have. So uh, just the, the, the sub-targets or the, 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 the let's say, the, the breakout of uh, targets. So the first part is to, to do the manufacturing of, uh, of the LGATS uh, sensors for this uh, technology demonstrator. Then uh, we have to integrate everything. So we have to, once we have the, the LGATS, we have to take uh, to produce all the rest, so all the power distribution, the clock distribution, uh, electronics, the AQ, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, let's say the full integration of the system. Then uh, there is also a very important aspect, which is uh, we need to assess the, the feasibility uh, to scale this system to something bigger, because uh, if you let me go back to this slide, so this um, 12 centimeters times 12 centimeters is, is, is fine for, for a demonstrator. It's, it's just a, a proof of concept uh, and, and that's okay. But obviously, if you want to go to, to an industrial application, you typically need to have larger detectors. For example, the ones that are being used by Sidenor or Ferroglobe are of the order of one meter times one meter. So a key aspect of the project is to to, to make all this design and construction, but taking always into account that the system has to be a scale. So we, we, we want to assess this, um, the feasibility of this. And then there is a last, uh, a last aspect, which is the, the algorithmic part. So the, the development of, uh, of a high resolution deep learning algorithm, which is implementing the, the momentum, which is using the momentum information, because this is, um, the, it's not obvious since this has not been measured by anyone in the context of Mion tomography. The algorithms are not adapted to use the, the momentum. The, for the purely geometrical, it's very simple because those are the, the most uh, simple algorithms. So you can just uh, use the momentum in a very, let's say, a straightforward uh, way. But those algorithms are not the, the, the most powerful. So the idea is to try to build something which is really combining all the spatial information, the time information, the momentum, et cetera. And then the, the target, let's say, is uh, to come from this uh, TRL of, uh, of uh, two, which is essentially a concept and an idea, and to try to, to take it to the level four, which is a, a laboratory prototype in which uh, we can show that the, the idea is working and also where we can claim uh, things about the scalability. And, and well, this uh, brings me to, to the conclusions. So, uh, well, Mion tomography can be applied as a testing technique uh, for structural integrity in the industry. Uh, we are working in this for the Tomulgat project, uh, addressing the problem of the momentum measurement in Mion tomography. Uh, and I, I believe that is going to be a game changer for, for many applications having this information. The, the aim of the project is to build a demonstrator uh, to the level of uh, level four in technology readiness level, uh, taking into account the scalability of the, um, of the system. Uh, and of course, if the outcome of this project is uh, successful, uh, I, I would say that this would motivate the, um, the possibility of uh, building a large scale detector, uh, probably taking into account the stakeholders, uh, like for example, Sidenor or Ferroglobe, that maybe uh, are interested even in, in being early adopters of the technology. And thank you very much. I think that's, that's all from my side. Thank you, Pablo.
Thank you for the presentation. It was a very thorough explanation of mean tomography, its applications, and the project. You are now involved. Um, it's almost half past one, but we have time for some quick questions if there is anybody willing to do them. So we open up the floor. You can turn on your microphones or write them on the chat. We will read them out loud. So it's your turn. We also have Salva. I don't know if he wants to add anything to what you oh, Yes, I, I have a, a question. I have a okay. question because uh, well, I, I, my first question is related with the, the the real size of the of the of the of the of the camera. I mean, you Pablo said that there is about around one meter, one one square meter more or less. But how you do you manage? How ma do you manage in the real applications this this big camera? Uh, it's very difficult to manage all the all the measurements in order to go to put the camera into the real situation into the industries in order to to take. Uh, the measurements and, and to control the quality of the measurements? Yes, yes. Actually, the, uh, this is connected to... I, I didn't mention that explicitly, but this is connected connected to this uh, packaging thing to some extent. It's, it's, it's not really only the packaging of the of the detectors. In, in many of these applications, the, the space that you have is quite limited. So you cannot place the, you cannot place the detectors wherever you like because in general, the environment is quite busy and, and this might be problematic. So in, in my experience, usually uh, you always find a place where to put the detectors, uh, but it, this is something that usually, uh, I mean, takes some thinking, let's say. You, usually you need to go to the factory, you need to talk to the people there and, and you make an agreement about where to put these things. I, I mean, as, as I'm saying, uh, in general, um, you you can do it and you find the you find the spot in where to place the detectors. But it's true that it's not uh, trivial. I mean, it's not whatever you want. And in some cases, it's problematic because, for example, it's forcing you to be uh, at a given distance between the two detectors because one you can put it only in in one particular place and the other one in another place. You would be willing to put it uh, closer, for example, but it's not possible because there are other things and all these things have to be taken into account. And, but in general, I mean, you, 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 you find a way to, to get it through because uh, the, the big detectors, the ones which are one meter square, usually the thickness is of the order of, um, uh, with all the layers of detection, uh, you have about uh, half a meter, more or less. So let's say that is uh, uh, one square meter times uh, half a meter. And usually it's fine. Usually you find a place. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Salva. OK, any last question? Yeah, I don't see. I have a last question. <laughs> Sorry, those. Okay, I, then I take profit of that. Yes, uh, in, refer in reference with the with the Tomologat project, which is the more risky step in the project? I assume you are to have we have the Elgats, Do you have the the tomogra the moon camera? Uh, we have the system, but what is the most risky step in in put together working? Because hmm. I assume that. If we have every piece working alone, but which is the reason in order to put all the pieces working together in order to, 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 obtain, to guarantee the final success of the, of the project? Yes, yes. I, I, I think that the, uh, probably um, making a risk um, uh, evaluation, I would say that the full integration of the, um, of the, of the system uh, might be uh, probably one of the one of the most critical aspects because um, uh, in the end in the end uh, we are going to we are going to build uh, so the LGATs were designed and many of the aspects of the design uh, the, the ones that we have access to and that we we know how they work etc uh, for the CMS application 
But it's true that there are some differences between the CMS application and the application that we are doing here. Uh, so in the end, uh, we, we need to think very well how we are going to, to integrate the LGATs and how we are going to do all this uh, full system because um, that, can be, that can be problematic. So the, the point is that probably we cannot mimic exactly what is being done in CMS exactly. Uh, and, and I guess that we can uh, profit from the current designs to some extent, but that is going to introduce also, uh, uh, I mean, we will have to innovate, I'm pretty sure, for some aspects. And, and of course, well, these were never tested and, and I think it might be risky, but uh, well. Uh. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Sarva. Uh, okay, as it is half past one, it's time to finish. So uh, we will wrap everything. Uh, thank you very much, Pablo, for the presentation. A pleasure. Uh, it was uh, really interesting, and we will have it on YouTube for everyone to see. Uh, thank you, Sarva, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone who attended. Uh, we will see each other next week and um, have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. You too. Bye bye.